Bonsoir, mes amis. Welcome. I'm uh, Barb Dawson, the Director of Education and Engagement, and want to welcome you tonight. I want to be sure to thank all of our members and the Visionary Society who make events like this possible. And I would like to introduce our Chairman, um, C CEO, and President of our museum, John Morris. Thank you, Barb. Well, she said chairman, but let me right off the bat say that our chairman of the board is with us tonight, Steve Jackson, here in the front row. So thank you, Mr. Chairman and other members of the board who serve voluntarily and with distinction, the best board in town. Uh, we've got a number of other board members uh, with us tonight. Want to spay, right off the bat say, some of you may know this, but where we stand right now and sit is the oldest French founded, established, continuous community west of the Alleghenies in the United States of America. We owe the French a great debt. Uh, and we also, we also owe the French a great debt for our, our freedom, our democracy, our revolution. We are uh, really pleased to be developing a great relationship with France. Here in Peoria, Illinois, we have been so pleased, uh, thanks to a happenstance meeting by Dr. Jim McGee, who's with us tonight, a uh, member of our Visionary Society, uh, and I had a chance to establish diplomatic relations with the French Council uh, in New York, who led us to the French Consulate in Chicago, and we are joined tonight by the science attache of the French Diplomatic Corps to the United States, uh, Dr. James Datt. James, would you stand and be recognized, please? Thank you. James has been to the Peoria Riverfront Museum more times this year than most Peorians. And we welcome you back because we're going to be doing more to celebrate our French heritage. We have a substantial French collection, uh, and we're proud of that, of that connection. Uh, we are joined tonight by so many... Is there a member of the museum in the house? See that? Now, if you didn't raise your hand, we've got the materials at the front desk. Uh, the members of this museum now number a record 4,300 strong. And our visionary society members, those who contribute $1,000 or more a year, number 330 strong now. Isn't that incredible? So for all of you who support the museum, you make exhibitions like Da Vinci, The Genius, and The Secrets of the Mona Lisa possible. And I want to say thanks to every one of you. Tonight we are in for an incredible experience. We have with us Pascal Cott, the foremost expert on the Mona Lisa on planet Earth. Here from Paris, France, he came through Copenhagen uh, and arrived in Peoria on a very snowy night, late but in time. Uh, he's been here for a day, and we are so pleased to have him, and I know that's why you're here tonight. We also have with us a great supporter of the museum and a personality who's known for his love of interviewing. He's a tax attorney. Uh, I say he's a frustrated journalist as, and, and a prominent tax attorney because he's, he loves interviewing. His name is Ed Sikowski, and Ed had a longstanding a program called Interesting People. Some of you remember Interesting People? And the PB, I see that, fans. Uh, and so uh, Ed has been working with Pascal to kind of delve into the, some history about who he is and who Leonardo da Vinci is. So we're going to have kind of a multi-part program tonight in which Ed Sikowski interviews Pascal Cott. Pascal has brought some rich and important and interesting materials for us. So uh, who's ready for Pascal Cott? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, on behalf of the Peoria Riverfront Museum uh, and our interviewer, Ed Sikowski, help Ed and I welcome Pascal Cott and Ed Sikowski. Come on out. Thank you. Thank you. Pascal. So, yes. Um, how was the trip over? How many hours? Uh, too long. <laughs> <laughs> That's more than five, I take it. Oh, more, more, more. Because, uh, yes, I leave my house. It was uh, 8 o'clock in the morning, and I arrive. It was uh, quite midnight here. So. Did they serve wine? 
Yes. <laughs> and cheese. But uh, I choose, uh, yes, in, in the plane, I choose a uh, Australian wine. Very good, yes, I recommend. <laughs> now, what does your wife think of all this? What is? Well, your wife think of you traveling all over the world. Oh She's my not with you. No, you know I have five children, and my wife has enough uh, to work. So she <laughs> so is the housewife. Yes. And you are the self-taught engineer. Yes. Why did you get into this engineering business? Or how? Uh, you know, I'm interested in the light and the problem of the light and the physical property of the light uh, since I was very young. I don't know why. Perhaps because um, uh, I was afraid, uh, when I was very young, I was afraid in the dark. So the light for me, it, uh, it's magic and to understand the light, it's uh, a way to, to feel me better, to understand what is it, the physical and the optical property of the light. So as a kid, you were afraid of the dark. Ah, yes. Yeah, yeah. And so this w naturally caused you to be interested in uh, light. That, that could be one explanation, I don't know. Well, I what else did you do when you were a kid? When I am a kid? Yeah, very young. What was your favorite pastime? My favorite pastime? Well, uh, well, what was the question? <laughs> you, you don't have question about when I <laughs> <laughs> Now, did you like playing soccer, drinking wine, uh, mm, skiing? Uh, what no, did uh, my passion. Uh, I have to think. Oh, it's complicated. Um, I, I play shark. Uh, was a shark? Shark, you know, no, uh, I mean, it's échec. Okay. Um, what about skiing? Did you ski? What sort of si Yes. Soccer and... No, no, skiing, yes. So you got into this business of f being a self-taught engineer. Yes, well, I go back to... I follow my father because my father go to Brazil in Sao Paulo. And we... <coughs> so I follow my father there. And then I come back to Paris to study medicine. Medicine. Medicine, yes. But uh, quickly I understand that it's not for me. <laughs> so um, so I, I fall in, uh, I, I bought a computer. It was at the time, in the, uh, just at the beginning of the 80. It was the beginning of the first personal computer. So I bought one, uh, one personal computer. I, and, uh, I understand that the future is in personal computer. So I decided to to understand the computer, and so I built by myself some electronic cards to put inside. So I learned electronics by myself. <coughs> and uh, I designed some electronic cards, and I designed a, a later a video computer with a team of engineers. Well, and you teach also? I teach now, but it's very, it's, uh, it's new. That make three years that I teach now. How do you feel about teaching? Are, aren't oh, you it's teaching? It's magic. <laughs> uh, yes, teaching, it's incredible. You, you have in front of students that have a lot of questions. They discover everything. And because you have a background and you know uh, all, the, all the, the answer of all the questions, it's a really pre real pleasure to, to teach to uh, new people. Because uh, I teach in the University of Bologna. And um, it's, uh, it's not a lesson with the auditorium. It's a practical way to teach. So I, I use my camera and I teach them, teach them the, how they can use it, for which kind of application. And I have a, a different students, students from, from art history, students from um, physical, optical, chemical, chemical people, so div very different uh, uh, students and parkour of, uh, of um, <laughs> so different, uh, yes, different parkour. Have you ever thought that teaching is a way of extending your life expectancy? Um, I will say that studying uh, will open the door of many um, humanities. But aren't, aren't you communicating in, in your professional activities, this, I'll call this your day job, your passion, 
this you're communicating, are you not? You're teaching. Teaching is now a new job for me, yes. Because I do, of, of course, I scan some painting from custo for customer. So I have a, a panel of different customers who have paintings. They are questioning about their, their painting. It is a Gauguin, it is a Van Gogh, I, I don't know. So I make investigation, but I make only scientific investigation. And they are, they are always disappointed because I never give the answer of the question. Well, that's the Socratic method, is it not? You uh, pose the question and you let the student answer it. I am, yes, and I share this with my students. For example, the, I give you a concrete example. We studied recently uh, a painting of Van Gogh. Uh, not of Van Gogh, of Gauguin, school, sorry. And so the question is, it is a fake or not? If it is not a fake, we, which kind of scientific elements I can provide to help the, the owner to demonstrate to the expert, because I am not expert, so I cannot tell you this painting is a goga or not. I can provide scientific elements or statistics. I can provide statistics to help you to, to say, yes, this painting is from this painter or not. Now, I'm thinking about this in terms of the application as to a commercial endeavor. It seems to me you're doing this because you're passionate about this. You're not seeking wealth. This is something that makes you a whole person. Is that fair? Uh, commercial application of this, uh, this camera, that's make 10, uh, 15 years that I try to find a commercial application. There is no way. So this is not profitable? No. No, no. just the price of the camera is crazy. Who, well, can, is who can pay one half million of dollars for a camera? It's stupid. <laughs> so Only Pascal Cotte can do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not sure anyone else can emulate what you're doing because of the cost of the camera and the passion that you've exhibited. In other words, this is a one-off. Only you can do this worldwide. Is that fair? Yes. And how do you feel about that? I feel that I, um, I can make my passion discovering new things. That's, that is my passion, discovering new things. Two, months, uh, two weeks ago, I discovered a, a, new, a new palimpsest. You know what is a palimpsest? This no. is an no. uh, ancient parchment. This is a parchment. Oh, uh, and a sheepskin? It's a sheep or veal, I don't know exactly but which kind of animal, but it was it's a skin animal. Of yeah, an ski, animal. Ski on an animal, yes. Yeah. So, it's, so they make a book with 100 pages. So they kill 100 animals to do this, <laughs> this book. Okay? And so the price of this uh, book is because 2,000 years ago, uh, there is no paper. So they use a parchment to make a book. And sometimes, if nobody reads the book, they take the, the page and they wash, or they, they, they scratch. The yeah, so you're saying if, if you have a sheepskin, yes. it's very expensive, so it's used multiple times. Then you can use uh, two, three, four times. But then when we have the, the Gutenberg press, there was paper. Ah, uh, yes, but uh, this is uh, 1,000 years later. Yes. So historically, paintings were done on animal skins. Yes, so, so my passion was to help this uh, researcher to read the text that uh, is hidden inside the, the parchment. So you want to see what's beneath the, the first layer. Yes, but b because even if you scratch the, um, uh, the writing, the ink go inside the parchment, so you cannot uh, remove that. So, it's, so it's you have a very it's, it's quite invisible with the naked eye. It's a discovery. So you so are. So I help. Yes, I. In in process, you're discovering a new world, because at that time it was a different world when the. Ah yes, it's a ancient Greek, so it's a it's a it's a famous writing of Ptolemy. Ptolemy he was a mathematician, astronomical, etc. And he, have, um, he, he put the, the basement, the mathematical basement of 
the um, geocentrism. Geocentrism, this is... So he demonstrates with mathematics that the Earth is at the center of the universe. <laughs> the, the Earth yes. was. Yes, yes. Well, it's a so, little, little so off. all the planets turn around the Earth. And the sun turned around the well, Earth. One time we, uh, and he makes a demonstration. So it, 2,000 years ago, it was Ptolemy, uh, uh, it was uh, the first century after death. Well, one time we thought the Earth was flat also. At this time? Uh, no, 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 not no, at that no, time, no, no. but at one time we thought... Ah, yes, much better. But today, you know, there's some people that think that the, always that the, the Earth is flat. Well, well, let's talk about Leonardo for a minute. This is the man. That's right? Yes. And I'd like to explore this picture. Uh, do you know how much this was sold for? It's a Picasso, this one. Yeah, $179.4 million in 2015. Uh, we'll talk about this one. Uh, this guy was sold for $300 million in 2015. Three hundred million. Who it is? Uh, this is uh, Koenig interchange. <laughs> if I'm, and I could be ah, wrong. This one I know. Yeah, this <laughs> one. Uh, uh, Leonardo. Uh, th this was sold for four hundred and fifty million dollars. Yeah. And only the Bill Gates and Melinda Gates can afford to buy it, and even they couldn't buy it. Uh, I get this painting in hands. You did. Yes. Well, I was working in Geneva, and so when Mr. Bouvier bought it, um, uh, so I asked him, may I scan the painting? He said, no, 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 no. He was afraid, <laughs> yes. perhaps, that it was not the no, real no, painting. No. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't, wanna, pity, uh, you don't necessarily want to know the truth. I mean, people aren't coming to your doorstep so after they invested millions of dollars in the uh, painting. So as a matter of fact, uh, except for insurance companies, uh, you're not really an attractive guy. But, no, but even for the insurance companies, they don't want to know. If you insure a fake, they're happy <laughs> because it is a fake. <laughs> they don't have to pay. If someone stole the painting, they say, oh, it's a fake. <laughs> We don't have to pay. That, that's <laughs> got to be a great business, in insuring paintings. Ah, yes. And <laughs> so what they would do is engage you before they would insure the painting and say, is this a fake? Well, great, we'll insure it for $100 million. Yes, exactly. So you <laughs> didn't realize you've got a great racket here. <laughs> you know that? Well, let's talk about uh, Leonardo a little bit here uh, before I get to uh, uh, the, uh, the Mona Lisa. Uh, the point is this, uh, well, let's just turn to it. This is about uh, 30 inches by 21 inches, and it's 18 pounds. And the value is $2.5 billion. Oh, no, more, more than that. Well, I... Yes, I, I read a novel. I read a novel. Uh, and so that, uh, the novel starts like this. The, the French government was in bankruptcy. And the French government decided to, to sell to the Americans uh, the Mona Lisa. And uh, the Americans pay 12, million, 12 billion dollars. 12 billion. Yes. I think this is a, uh, a good value for the painting. <laughs> 12 billion. You buy it? Well, that's pr probably the size of some economies uh, of uh, major companies, 12 billion. The last time that we sell something to the American, it was the Louisiana, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I think our current president <laughs> is that we've got to make sure he doesn't sell Alaska. <laughs> so, The Last Supper, this is the world's most viewed painting. Yeah. And the, the observation I, I came up with is, uh, is a rare combination of engineering uh, anatomy and painting. And so if you look carefully at this picture, the angles are, and you as an engineer would appreciate that. Oh yes, the perspective is perfect. Huh? In this so and, and th so it's, there's no attempt to achieve an acceptable state of imperfection. This is perfection in, in a real sense. Is that mm. fair? Yes, that's fair. Yeah. Um, let's talk about Leonardo for a minute. Uh, 
He was born in 1452 in Florence, and he lived a ripe old age of uh, 67. And I say a ripe old age, uh, this is another one of his pictures, but the world life expectancy at that time was about 25, 30 years, and yet he lived to 67. If he were alive today and sitting here, what would he be saying to us? Uh, I am old. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you were talking about his diet? I, 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 I died and carry, I mean, what do I eat? What, how, how can a man exist in that environment for 67 years when everyone around him was dying at age 25? I don't know. Maybe I don't know. I suppose if you're an artist, you get to uh, live a little longer. Now, his father was a notary or an attorney, basically. And he was uh, born out of wedlock. And uh, his mother was Katrina, a farmer's daughter. Yeah, yeah. You recall mm -hmm. that? Mm -hmm. And the in I found it kind of interesting. At that point, many women would die at childbirth. Mm -hmm. And so his father was married four times in each case of individuals aged 15 or 16. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is, a, I think, a Charlie Chapman in today's world, uh -huh. multiple marriages, multiple children, with all young wives. And so that was the situation. Because of his birthright, mm -hmm. he could not inherit, and he couldn't be part of a government. So he was disabled in the sense that he couldn't do the normal, I'll call them normal things. And so early on, didn't he recognize that, geez, I've really got to do something with my life because I can't do the typical. Have you thought about something like that? I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> no, but he, he, had, he had no opportunity to be a politician or to compete in the natural world. Um, no, Leonardo, no. So he had to do something else. Uh, his, natura, his natural uh, ambition was to, to, make a, to, to draw, to create, to create and to understand the nature, to reproduce the nature. And um, this is the reason why he asked to his father to go quickly to Florence, to Florence for studying with uh, um, uh, Verrocchio in the workshop of Verrocchio. He quickly uh, leaves uh, the small village of Vinci to go there in Florence because uh, it was the future for him. Well, what I'm suggesting to it may very well be that he did what he did by default. By default? Oh, no. I don't think so. No, no. So he was. He, he was really decided. This was to a genius. He, he was. This is in in his brain. He didn't know what he wanted to do, of course. But uh, as whole young people, you at the beginning you don't know what you want to do. But uh, really, he have a, a very powerful brain that's able to study everything. So he can study. Uh, anatomy, he can study music, he can study uh, geographic, and mechanic, engineering, and, uh, and of course, painting. Paintings. For, for him, painting was not uh, art, it was first a science. A science, a combination of engineering yeah, and yes, anatomy. Yes, yes. And I think of this picture that is perfect in the sense of having been constructed perfectly engineering-wise. Did yes, you have a combination in this drawing. You have the combination of uh, humanity. You have a s uh, geometry, uh, science, and the quality of the drawing. It's, it's crazy. So it is unusual for a human being to have those three characteristics, anatomy, engineering, and painting. Yeah. So this man was really a Renaissance man, never been replicated since then. He had 13 areas, or 16 areas, that he was a specialist in. He did, did magnificent work in 16 separate areas and lived to the ripe old age of 67. Unusual. Um, let's talk about your involvement, and let's start with you into your presentation. So my personal involvement, so first I am an engineer, so I, I designed uh, this camera, this incredible camera. It was the first multi-spectral high-resolution camera that provide 200 
240 million pixel, pixel multiplied by 13 that give 3 billion over 3 billion of pixels. How does that compare with the typical camera that you would purchase? Well, you, you have a professional camera, you have 40 million pixels. It's no comparison between 40 million pixels and 3 billion pixels. And the worth of this camera? The worth? In dollars? Professional camera, I don't know. No, no, uh, of your I'm camera. Ah, I'm a half million dollars. Because I use a sensor that uh, do not exist anymore. So I, I use a sensor that was built for the satellite uh, spot image to, to analyze the weather. And uh, so this sensor do not exist anymore. So uh, uh, Thompson make this sensor for the, for the customer, for spot, spot satellite. And uh, they, they spend a million dollars to do it. And uh, by chance, I, I knew someone in the Thompson company, and I called him and I would like to use this sensor. I mean, if you have a ten million dollar, yes, you can have it. I said no, no, no. And um, it's not possible. So I want to design a camera using this sensor. And uh, in fact, they have um, when they manufacture a sensor, they make a lot of sensors, and they they test all the sensors one by one to check that it can work on the satellite because uh, when, it, when it is uh, in the sky, it's not possible to repair. So, <laughs> you, have, so you have to be sure that the sensor work uh, very well. And so it tell me, yes, we have some, some sensor. We, we don't know if they work perfectly for the, for the satellite, but you can use it. So this is uh, how I get this sensor and I put it in, in my, inside my camera. So I designed the camera. I was very happy and no customer. <laughs> so, so I go to the Louvre and say, I, I have designed this camera. Are you interested? Do you, yes, we don't have money, but uh, we can make a European project and we can make it that the camera is working and uh, we can applicate and use your camera for scanning the paintings. So this is one in uh, 2001, and in 2004, uh, the prototype was running perfectly, so I, my design was perfect, and uh, so they asked, me, they asked me to digitize Mona Lisa. And so that's where it began? Th th that changed my life, totally. Now, let's, let's talk about your presentation, your slide presentation. Let's start there. Hello. Interesting. <laughs> uh, yes, it is. So my presentation is in six parts. First, we, we, are, we are questioning about who, who is Mona Lisa. I will talk, of course, about uh, the camera, how I have recovered the genuine colors of Mona Lisa. I will talk, of course, about the, a new technique that he invents called the LAM technique. We will see the discoveries that I have found inside Mona Lisa, and we will talk about some hypotheses about. Uh, so, this is very strange because this painting has different name. In French, we call we call her La Joconde, and Mona Lisa, and you will see that Mona Lisa with two N, like in Italian, because the Italian call call her La Gioconda and the rest of the world call, uh, call him uh, Mona Lisa. And this is important, this part is important because we will see that some uh, historians also uh, talk about Mona Lisa and La Joconde. So Leonardo died in, uh, in uh, 1519, but before he died, he gave all the painting he gave all the painting to Salai. Salai and Melzi was the uh, two people of Leonardo working in his, wo in his uh, workshop. And um, so Leonardo gave all the manuscript to Melzi, Francesco yeah. Melzi, and he gave all the painting to Salai. In, he gives before the death, so in 1518. 
So in 1518, the, the French king François Ier decided to buy the painting. Well, let me interrupt. He, when, uh, when Leonardo died, the painting wasn't finished, is that right? Yes. The so painting was in France, yes. So these two gentlemen helped finish it. Is, uh, who, el who helped finish it? No, uh, the painting was finished. Oh, it was finished. I've the heard the, painting the stories no, I've heard no, it no, wasn't no, quite no. finished. No, the painting was finished. Uh, Leonardo arrived in France with three paintings. Uh, and uh, the Saint Jean Baptiste, uh, la, uh, la Saint Anne, et, um, and uh, Mona Lisa. So uh, Salai go back to, I to, to Italy, and so the French king sent him an incredible amount of money to pay for the. Um, so he purchased the Mona Lisa, the ex exorbitant price. Uh, of uh, equivalent of uh, three years of uh, royal pension uh, to Leonardo. So it's, uh, I don't know, I like um, 10 million dollars, I will say. In today's dollars. Yeah, to, yes. Crazy, uh, crazy price for, for this painting. But that's a pretty good investment. Ah, yes, a big investment, <laughs> an interesting investment. <laughs> And uh, the story tells us that the painting was a star at the beginning, just a uh, few years, uh, 10 years after, there is a lot of copies. We, do, we don't wait the, 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 the store, the, the threats of the Mona Lisa in uh, 1911 to, to, be, to, to, be, to, uh, to be famous. The painting was famous at the beginning. And all uh, in all the city of Europe, everybody wants a copy of this painting. So I have found uh, 72, 72 copies, but in fact there is much more because I found in the um, in in the uh, in the catalog of the Louvre, and the catalog is that at uh, 80, 59, 50, I don't, I cannot read it. Uh, 59, yes, 8059. And I read this sentence, it's crazy. La Joconde de Léonard de Vinci n'a été copiée que 71 fois. Well <laughs> so, Mona Lisa has been copied only, uh, the word that I prefer is only. Only 17 times in one year. Copied. Copied. Official and copy. And sold? Authorized by the law. Would, they be, uh, would you sell these after they were copied? Or what would you do with the copy? Well, no, I, I think it's a personal copy or copy for uh, someone. Well, I don't know. But you, so the law authorizes you. you know, it's not possible today, but you can make a copy of uh, all the painting in the law. So the, the Tuesday, every Tuesday, you can go to the law and make a copy if you want. Today's what you can use your... Yes, yes. But uh, the report, the official report of the Louvre is 71 copies just for this year. Imagine the next year. <laughs> well the now. number of copies, you multiply by 500 and you, you will have the number of copies of Mona Lisa. Well, exists. everyone has a cell phone with a uh, camera on it so you can make multiple copies. Ah, yes, okay. And we have another proof of that the uh, painting was very famous on this manuscript. Uh, from Cassiano dal Pozzo, so he make a journal to, to report his trip uh, over Europe. And um, Cassiano explains that uh, the king of England, the Mona Lisa was so famous that the king of England wanted to, to have the original. And so he asked, uh, he claimed the Mona Lisa as a wedding present for his daughter. He sends, his, and his, uh, because the, the, the king said no, he sent the Duke of Buckingham to intervent, uh, and uh, the Duke of Duke Buckingham do not reach to have the painting, so he asked to the painter Rubens, and the, at the end, the, the King of France said no. <laughs> so there is a big ambiguity about the name, because Giorgio Vasari, so you have to figure out that Giorgio Vasari uh, wrote this book about uh, f 30 years later, uh, after the death of Leonardo. And uh, so when Leonardo died, uh, Giorgio Vasari was uh, seven years old. So we do not know about 
we never meet uh, Leonardo da Vinci. So he just um, he just uh, listens to another painter in the city of Florence, and he wrote the, the biography of uh, of Leonardo. And about Mona Lisa, about Mona Lisa, uh, he make a very beautiful description of Mona Lisa, and this descri this, this description do not match with Mona Lisa today. And more than that, he really explains that uh, the Mona Lisa was not finished. So we, so this testimony date probably uh, in 1507, because, because in 1507, uh, Leonardo left Florence. So the last testimony of Mona Lisa by the painter of Florence was 1507. And in 1507, the painting was not finished. Well, that's what I alluded to, but it wasn't a death. It was the fact that it wasn't finished at that time. At that time, 1507. Yes. Vasari wrote We have another testimony that um, uh, Leonardo paints the portrait of Lisa Gerardini. Is this inscription in the margin of a book? And uh, so <coughs> it's clear because you have uh, Leonardo uh, does in all his painting as as is the head of the head, not the painting, the head of Lisa del Giocondo. And we have the date, October 1503. So we know for sure that he paints the portrait of Lisa Gerardini, Lisa del Giocondo. Um, I'm thinking about the issue that you've addressed, the multiple layers. Is there... Uh, yes, wait, 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 wait. Oh, wait okay. Wait, 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 yes, yes, yes. But we have a big problem with this story. This is the testimony of Leonardo himself. What says Leonardo about this portrait? He says that he paints a Florentine woman done from life at the instance of the late magnificent Giuliano de Medicis. Giuliano de Medicis was the patron of Leonardo at the end, after 1530. 13, 1513. So, um, so there is no link between a very aristocratic people like uh, Giuliano de Medicis and Mona Lisa. There is no link. So this is impossible that Giuliano de Medicis asked to, uh, to Leonardo to make a painting of a portrait of a woman of uh, the merchant of fabrics. It's stupid. There is no way. So you're suggesting that history isn't very fair and objective in what really went on in the world. I agree, we, and we have many writing testimonies that Leonardo paints the portrait of Lisa Gerardini. No doubt about this. Okay. But this is not the, the testimony of Leonardo himself. Now, he was left-handed? Yes. Yes, but this, this writing is not from Leonardo. This is, this is uh, secretary of the cardinal. Uh, the cardinal was in, in mission to, 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 re, to, to make a trip over Europe for the pope. So the pope, the pope asked the cardinal to go in different city over Europe and to report what's happened in, uh, with the French, with, with, with the French, with the German, with the Spanish, etc. So he was in France. And so, of course, he visits the French king, and uh, because he, he knows that Leonardo was very close to the house of the French, to the castle of the French king, he makes a visit to Leonardo. The cardinal makes the visit, and Leonardo testimony that he paints on demand of Giuliano de Medicis. Now, when he uh, was commissioned or underwritten to uh, do a painting. Uh, that would take a painting might take uh, nine months a year to do a, a full full painting or not. I mean, how quickly did he paint? Uh, the problem with Leonardo is uh, most of the time he do, he do not deliver the painting, so uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's always a problem. So we have we are for sure twelve paintings from Leonardo for sure. 
Not, so not, that uh, not more. His history is about 50 years of doing it. And uh, uh, you will see it's more complex because, um, attends, we have to go back to this, yes. So Giuliano de Medicis was a new patron in 1513. It was a new patron of Leonardo. And U Giuliano de Medicis was the brother, in fact, of the Pope. The Pope was Giovanni di Lorenzo de Medicis. And so Giovanni uh, became the Pope and he asked to his brother to come in the Vatican City. So Giuliano arrived with Leonardo. So he engaged Leonardo. And Giuliano was um, also, the, also the father of a small, uh, small boy, and we will see the story at the end. So another the last testimony that we have about um, the name uh, of, uh, of, of Mona Lisa is this one. So um, this is Paolo Lomazzo. He write a, a biography of, uh, of Leonardo, and uh, he received, it was very late, it was in 1580, yes, 1580, so 15 years, 50 years after the death of Leonardo. But he received this testimony from Melzi, you, re you remember Melzi, Francesco Melzi that I explained at the beginning. So Melzi explained to Paolo Lomazzo that, in fact, uh, the portrait of uh, Mona Lisa is, in fact, the portrait of Gioconda et de Mona Lisa. The word et, this is the, the, the character et. And the, the, this character. Ah. Alors, for art historian, it's a nightmare. <laughs> so, this is a, an error. You understand? The printer make an error. Because this is impossible. It's, eh, Gioconda e eh, Mona Lisa. Well, if you can't rely upon documents, what can you rely upon? Oral testimony, and in they're fact, all no, dead. Because Melzi explained that he paint Mona Lisa and over it, he cover it with the Gioconda. Why? Ah, you will. This is another story. I will explain at the end. But now we have to demonstrate if it is uh, real or not. So I was invited by the Louvre in, uh, so in October 2004, <coughs> and they bring me Mona Lisa. So Mona Lisa is not a canvas. Mona Lisa is painted on wood. Okay. So this is a plank of poplar wood. So you have the prototype of the camera here. And I use a very special lighting to illuminate the painting because I was not uh, I was not authorized to illuminate to put too much light on the painting, so I design a, a lighting that, like a scanner, sweep over the painting. Is there any opportunity of this damaging the painting? Or no, sure? no. They sweep the thirteen times. And inside the camera, I change. I have a kind of filter wheel. It's not. A, it's not a fuel wheel. It's a barrel, filter barrel. And I change the filter so I can share the light. I can cut the light in very small bandwidth of wavelength, of wavelengths, wavelengths, from the UV to infrared. And so that gives me the capability, the capability, to make what we call spectroscopy. So for, that means for each pixel. So we have 240 million pixels, and for each pixel, I know exactly the interaction of the light and the materials. How long did this take you? Mm, two hours, about, about two hours. Yeah. But the, the, the antecedent, how long did it take you to develop this process? Ah, yes. I started, in, my first patent was in 1996. Why? Why did you do this when you knew it would take all these years? Uh, what, what because what? I have few money and uh, take time to, to make. Uh, no, no, I understand uh, that you did it, but why did you do it? I do it because um, I design many scanners and I always have the problem of color reproduction. So how to reproduce accurately this red? And the problem is complex because if this red under this light you have a perception of this red. But if you change the light, 
you go outside to the sun, to the sun to see this, you will see the red is different. So the complexity of reproduction, re how to reproduce a color, because the color change when you change the light. No, I understand that. This is a problem. It, I, I wanted to, s to solve this problem. But, but you, you, so that was your destiny, to solve this problem. To solve the problem of a color accuracy changing the lighting system. Uh, anyone else you know ever attempt this? Are you the only person in the world that had this passion? Uh, probably crazy like me, yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean crazy <laughs> and crazy smart. That is, you're, you're, you're not discovering a new country, but you're discovering something that no one else has discovered. Is that, I, I'm yeah. trying to understand what drives no, you I, to do this. In fact, I look at my wife. My wife, when she, when she, when she, she go to, 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 to buy a dress, okay, she's inside the shop, she, she chooses uh, the dress, and always, she takes the dress and go outside pour, pour, to see the color outside. And I wanted to, why did she do that? It's the same color, <laughs> okay? In fact, not. But Leonardo worked mostly outside. Uh, no, I don't know. That's maybe, what I maybe, maybe he worked with the candle. Well, I understood that he did a lot of his work outside for perhaps this very reason. So I designed the camera to solve this problem of color accuracy. I never imagined that I will scan the Mona Lisa. Uh, so now, now you, you developed the process, and as it relates to Mona Lisa, what was the conclusion or uh, so conclusions? Uh, so I developed uh, the, the camera, and uh, so the, the Louvre asked me to digitize Mona Lisa with one mission. Digitize, make, making a scientific measurement of the painting to measure precisely the color in 2004 with the possibility in 13 years or in 50, 50 years to rescan again and to measure how the Mona Lisa is aging, making a scientific measurement of the aging effect. This is uh, my mission and I do the job. So, to recover the genuine color, we are first to remove the old varnish because Mona Lisa is painted and covered on top with the, old, with the varnish. But the varnish is old now, is yellow, dark, and now is so yellow that the sky is not blue, it's green. So you can imagine that Leonardo never paint uh, sk uh, the sky green. It's stupid. So the, the sky is green now because you have uh, on top a, a kind of filter, a yellow filter. This is like you look everything with a yellow filter. It's stupid. So you have to remove that. But the interaction with the varnish and the pigment is complex. So I invent this method. And uh, you can see that I measure with my camera, I measure this blue. This is the, the curve of the blue without varnish, and here with a artificially edged varnish. Okay, you understand? Well, I'm, I'm wondering, is there a possibility you, you're delving down into what's going on in the painting? <coughs> what if the news is bad news? What if you uncovered something that is not a good thing? Is that possible? I mean. Maybe there was oh, some yes. kid doing something, and, and are, were you afraid of learning the? No, 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 no. To keep safe, to be quiet. No, no problem. There is no problem. No problem. <laughs> no, 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 no. So, no and, and so I just, I just do my job to, 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 to find a mathematical solution to solve the problem to remove the varnish on top of Mona Lisa because nobody in the Louvre want to clean really. To touch really the painting. No, my we do it on many paintings. On many, you, maybe you see the, the the reportage on Nova. You see, you, you see the reportage on Nova now. No. About, uh, okay, and the, so the, the no, usually the, the Louvre can take a painting and can clean the varnish, but on Mona Lisa they don't want no, to. No, my it. my concern is if I were the possessor of this billion-dollar 
piece of art. Yes. Why would I commission you to see what's really going on underneath the first layer? No, 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 they don't ask me that. They ask me to, to measure the color. No, no, I understand, but you, you do this for others. You do look ah, yes, other yes, yes, but the, the Louvre was not, uh, do not agree for that. Okay, so we now know that you're going through the process of uncovering no, no, multiple no. My layers. first mission is to measure the color and recover the genuine color of Mona Lisa. Okay. I do the job, so I explain how to do it. First, I remove the varnish. But I still have, under the varnish, not the real color. Because the, each grain of pigment is mixed with oil. And the oil also uh, is aging. And you have a, the oil is no more transparent. The oil is yellow, too. So we have to remove also the color of the oil. And to do that is more complex, so I have to first uh, uh, make a map of all the pigment used by Leonardo. This is all the pigment possible at the time of Leonardo, with different uh, knowledge uh, to explain uh, what's happened if I mix this pigment with a lead white, if I mix this pigment with a dark, etc. to understand uh, each pigment. And then my work was to, for each pixel, to identify the mix of pigment. So I take an example here. I take a pixel inside the sky of Mona Lisa, and my software uh, tells me that the, the, uh, there is 70% uh, uh, of lead white, 63% of lapis lazuli. It's a blue. Okay. But unfortunately, the software explained me that there is also 90% of uh, yellow. This is yellow, blanc de plomb, jaune de plomb. It's impossible, and Leonardo cannot put a yellow inside the sky. So I just remove the yellow in the formula, and I recalculate the genuine color. So at the end, so the result without the varnish, so unvarnished, And wow, <laughs> the genuine colors. This is uh, the colors when the F French King François Ier bought the painting. So this was the original, mm. this was the real yeah, yeah, McCoy. Uh, yes, yes. So my mission is finished. But I am engineer. <laughs> <laughs> and I develop a new technique to see not what is on the surface, but behind, under the surface of the painting. Because the Louvre make many investigations. They use uh, what we call false color infrared image, emissiography X-ray image, infrared, deep infrared, fluorescence image, X-ray, and they discover quite nothing new. Just if you look at the X-ray, the face seems to look on the right. It's different from the other image. So because I am interested of the light and the physical property of the light, I will demonstrate how I work my, uh, my camera. So the wavelengths, the penetration of the wavelengths inside the layer of paint. So you have to figure out that this, this is about one millimeter thick, and this is uh, the thickness of the paint layer, paint by Leonardo, about one millimeter, maybe one millimeter and a half, something like that, okay? And we know that from the wavelengths, so the blue wavelengths quite reflect on the surface and go back. So if I illuminate with the blue, the blue will reflect on the surface and go back to the camera. But the other wavelengths penetrate a little more, 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 up to the infrared. 
and all the museum in the world use infrared to see what is behind the, 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 the layer of paint. So my idea is, if we can see what is behind the, the, layer, the layer of paint, why we cannot see what is in between? If we, we can simply use the other wavelengths. And this is what I do. You're suggesting multiple layers. It could yes. be more than, it could be two, three, it could be five. In, in theory, it could be more than, more than one. And so, because the light okay, penetrate inside at different deepness inside the layer of paint, but the light have another property, the diffusion. So the, the, when a ray of light arrive on the top of the painting, depending on the wavelengths, you have a diffusion in 3D, in fact. Okay? And that is very important for the, to understand how works the LAM technique. So this, not, this is not the invention of Pascal Cotte. Huh? This is a physical property of the light, very well known. And so I obtain 13 images, and my invention is, in fact, to use different wavelengths and to obtain, making different calculations, calculating the frequency, making a Fourier transform, calculating the derivative and different mod mathematical applications. And I obtain different images of Mona Lisa. So I have 286 combinations with three pictures, 156 with uh, two pictures. And this is the result. Look at the face of Mona Lisa if you apply such kind of algorithm. It's crazy because you have different face. All in the same painting. Uh, All on that piece of wood. Yes. If I do the same on a Poussin painting, that changed quite nothing because Poussin is the sickness for Poussin. Poussin, Poussin Nicolas Poussin, a oh. uh, French painter. Okay. I, I mean but there, in other words, different painters use different techniques, different yes, yes. But on, uh, on Mona Lisa, it's crazy. That changed everything. So the, how many so, so the, the, the technique allow me to reconstruct all the layers. Because the, the technique provides 1,650 images that you have to analyze one by one. So that takes years. That uh, really takes years to study this painting. This is an example. Uh, I will, you will flip, I will flip um, 300 pictures, 300 images in real time. So I discover first that Leonardo uh, make a bigger portrait. And you have the demonstration with just, with just the outline of this bigger portrait. So this is different lamb lam image have with different frequencies. And you can see that at the beginning you have four fingers, and now you have three fingers. Look at this. So Leonardo began to make a bigger hand. Then he erased one finger and make it a smaller, a smaller hand. The face, look at the face. You have the outline of the face that is higher. And look at the nose. The nose, <laughs> the previous nose was higher. You see clearly the, the first position of the nose here. The hand, so the, this is the hand that the LAM technique recover under the hand today. Of course, if it chants the, the left hand, it chants the right hand too. So it make first the left hand much, much more bigger. So what's going on here? I mean, he's 
modifying the product every once in a while? Is that pleased with it? Le, le, le Leonardo always yeah. lo works like this. He, he always he, he starts a project and he changes his mind. He recovers and changes again. He so scratches it sometimes. So rather than uh, today's world, you would trash that yeah. and you would start from the beginning, but because of May the... No, no, because he paints on wood and it's very expensive. So you paint. had to use that. Yes, you have to reuse it because it takes years. You have to wait seven, minimum seven years that the, the plank of poplar is drying. Then you have to apply many layers of gesso so preparation to have a white and soft surface to paint because he, he wanted to paint on a really flat surface. So he wasn't He don't pleased. want to, pla to, to paint on canvas. Canvas, you have a relief, it's not good for No, paint. but he wasn't pleased with the product, so he tried to change it or improve the product. I, I, it sounds like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So but it's just that that technique is not used today, obviously, but th that's what it was then. A poplar, what would cost, what would the... It's not the cost of the poplar, but it's the, c the cost of the time because you have to wait. And it's, it's not easy to find a big tree with such dimension, with a good plank of poplar uh, th that, that uh, could be, uh, with the time, not uh, wrapping like this, but uh, uh, keep, f keep it flat. It's, it's uh, very difficult to find it. So when, when you find a good plank, you, you keep it. No, I understand, but uh, this man had uh, 16 different things that he did, not only painting. But uh, his day job consisted of other things. I mean, he was doing many things concurrently, designing uh, water systems and the like. So, uh, I mean, how can a man do this? He attached many, um, it for him, it was very important to have good materials and he study all the materials. When, uh, when uh, he, he asked to the carpenter to cut a tree, he asked to the carpenter, please give me only the part of the tree that is on the north. Because the part of the tree that is on the south receives the sun, and so this is not good. I prefer the part of the tree that is on the north. So you, you imagine that you have to ask to the carpenter, take care, mark the north, and cut the, to the, the plank just here. It's a crazy work, so he don't want to make it again. So he have a plank of poplar, he start a project, he don't agree with the project, he changes his mind, he scratch it, he erase, he redo again, or cover it. This is uh, exactly the story of this painting. So here he changed his mind about the size of the sleeve. You see? So I find the drawing of a bigger sleeve. Also the armrest, he changed his mind about the armrest. Okay. So he changed the position of the colon. And it's always like this with Leonardo. Now, I, uh, this question I'd like to understand. Uh, did he improve the product, or was it just in his own view that he, he liked? And is it any different? Is it better, or why would he keep doing this again? When he starts a project, he do it with uh, the ambition to reproduce uh, with more the fidelity as possible uh, what he wants to do. Doing that with the reality of what he began, he, under he understands that that do not match with, uh, with his ambition, so he changed uh, he, he changed his mind. <laughs> that's all. And that's okay. It's just that this process would take. We have so the same in the lady with the, the famous portrait uh, in Poland, in your country. Yes. Uh, okay. In Poland, there's a famous portrait of the lady with an ermine. He changed his mind. He began the portrait, uh, traditional portrait with a dress traditional at this time. Okay. And the, the dress code changed in 1480. So the, the, new, the new duchess changed the world how to, how to the aristocracy have to be dressed. So he changed the dress. And doing that, he had the small ermine. But the small ermine is a cute animal, so do not fit exactly with the vision of, uh, of uh, the power uh, the, of the Duke of Milan. 
So he, he changed the size of the animal and he put a, l a leg of lion. If you take care, the, the Hermine have a leg of lion. The Last Supper. No, I talk about... Ah, the no, Last no, Supper. No, no, I, I want to know about The Last Supper. How many <coughs> times did you, did you work over that? No, the, the Last Supper, I don't work on The Last Supper because it's a painting on, on, a, on a wall. <coughs> and it's the multispectral scanning on this painting is too much complicated. I see. But it's one of the more popular <coughs> paintings <coughs> in the world, The Last Supper. No, I think Mona Lisa is most famous. You're sure of that? <laughs> no, I have, uh, I have no doubt it's uh, the Monet is the most popular. If you say so it is. The second discovery that I made is in the sky of Mona Lisa. So if you look with the naked eye, there is quite nothing interesting. But with the lamp technique, I discover a drawing. So because I am not an art historian, I call an art historian, famous art historian, uh, Italian one. What, th what is that? What is it? Uh, this is the outline of a hairpin. Hairpin? Yes. And the problem is uh, this is impossible in the city of Florence to have an hairpin like this. Impossible. Because such kind of hairpin exists only on paintings but painting of an uh, unreal person, like uh, godness uh, or allegory of the justice, for example, or a Madonna. And we will see in the, uh, at the end of the lecture that uh, there is a possibility that uh, Leonardo paints a Madonna. So I measure exactly the size, dimension, etc., and I discover that it was such kind of hairpin. And, of course, because uh, I search all over the sky, I discovered 12 hairpins. And more than that, I discover all the outline of some draperies. And uh, so it's a headdress that have is totally different that we can f uh, have in the city of Florence at this time. So this, an, uh, this is an example of drawing made by Leonardo himself. We have, uh, uh, this is a Madonna, and you have uh, such kind of draperies on the, on the head. But uh, for me, the closest example is this one. You have pearls, uh, you have pins, and you have uh, uh, some kind of draperies. So for me, this is clearly uh, a project of a Madonna. This is another example of Madonna. Another discovery, just under the armchair, I discover here a star. And uh, in fact, there is five stars. And that could confirm the project of a Madonna, because it was usual to have uh, to paint Madonna with a dress with stars. So that could be a possibility to confirm the, 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 the second portrait, second uh, discovery in behind Mona Lisa. <coughs> of course, we have to recover the, the, the genuine portrait of Lisa Gherardini, be because we have the testimony the writing testimony that Leonardo paints the portrait of Lisa Gardini. But if we recover the portrait of Lisa Gardini, we have also to recover the dress and the headdress at this time in the city of Florence. This is all the example, no, this is three example of type of dress in 1503, 1504, 1507. Okay? And this is a portrait painted by uh, Raphael. This is a portrait of uh, Magdalena Doni. And you see exactly the characteristics, the description, the exact description of the dress at this time in the city, the role in the city of Florence. So you have the headdress, 
the headdress is uh, the dress, the hair attached in a net. You, you have a veil that uh, attach also the, the, the hair on the back. And uh, it's quite always finished with embroidery on the border of the veil. And uh, of course, you have a part line, mm -hmm. a hairline. The dress, you have a gamur. The shirt under the, the gamur. The sleeve, you, can, uh, at, you have to attach the sleeve on the gamur with the knots, called nastri in Italian. And the shoulder, the finestrelle. So the finestrelle is in fact the shirt that is behind uh, the, 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 the gamur. And uh, the shoulder are covered with a veil, called a acciaioli. So, but to make this portrait, Leonardo has to erase the portrait, the beginning of the portrait of the, of the Madonna. And he scratched it. And thanks to the lamp technique, I discovered all the line of the scratch it made by Leonardo to erase <coughs> the headdress of Madonna. Look at this. Well, it, it sounds like um, the dress is a function of that period, that time. So when the dress changes. Ah, it's not a fashion. It's not a good word. It, this is a rule. They have to follow a rule. Also, also for the colors, if you are from the family uh, medicines or the family uh, Jocondo, you don't have you don't have the same colors. So that not only the product but the colors. Are the colors. A, a change. This yes, at this time is a rule, not fashion. And uh, for for Mona Lisa, it was <coughs> very important to be dressed as a rule, because. This is a proof that she belonged to this, um, to this uh, aristocracy. Now, is it fair to say that this was the dress that the aristocratic women would be wearing? Yes. And so I, I don't want to allude to today's world, but isn't that kind of expensive <laughs> to have these multiple outfits and multiple attachments? That was not cheap. You can't get that at, at Kmart. You have to produce it. Yeah, somehow uh, uh, it's, it's another way to to manage a city because uh, if you have uh, the carpenter have to be dressed like this the lawyer have to be dressed like this oh so your station in life was a function uh, yes you have your function not only the, the if you are if you belong to the bourgeoisie or if you belong to the aristocracy you have to be dressed differently so our, all the art historian know that and so I'm, I'm very surprising that telling that the portrait of Mona Lisa is the portrait of Lisa Gherardini without the dress. It's impossible. So that it's, it's almost a uniform. Yes. And so I discover so many things inside, uh, and of course, but I discover a very important part of the technique of painting of Leonardo called the pouncing technique. And uh, in Ita we usually in painting, we use the Italian words spolvero. So the small bureau is a technique to transfer a drawing. So Leonardo make a drawing. So this is a drawing. Make a drawing. And he want to transfer, he make a drawing on the paper. And so, and he want to transfer the drawing on the plank of wood, prepared and totally white. So to do that, uh, he use a nail and he make some small dots following all the line of the drawing. Then he take a, a powder that he put in a small bag of uh, fabrics. And the powder go through the fabrics and you apply the, um, the bag, you apply the bag on the drawing. And so the powder of black go through the small uh, hole of uh, made with a nail. And when you remove the drawing, you get the drawing, the outline of the drawing. And then it was very important for me to discover the spolvero, because this is a proof that this painting was uh, made by Leonardo, because Leonardo always used the spolvero. If the painting have no spolvero, this is not a painting of Leonardo. And the problem is the Louvre never discovers the spolvero. 
And what do they say when you told ah, them? Ah, they say, um, we suppose that there is a small <laughs> row. <laughs> <laughs> Not to admit. Uh, but now, uh, now we, with my publications, uh, because my publication, I demonstrate the small row. So this is a small row of the outline of the head of, the, of Lisa Gerardini. Not the portrait today, the portrait of Lisa Gerardini. So if you outline this and you superpose Mona, uh, the, the portrait today, you see that the head is higher. So this is one proof that the original drawing of Lisa Gerardini is different than the portrait today. Also the parting, we have the, the, so the, the hair line here. The direction is different because Mona Lisa is a white line and Lisa Gerardini, the, this is a yellow, li yellow line. And you see there is a 40 degrees difference. Pascal. What does that mean for well, you? That means that it changes the position of the head. No, I understand that, but I'm thinking about the time that's required to come up with the Mona Lisa. I mean, how long did it take him? How many, in, in terms of days, months? Uh, we, we know that, no, we, we know that he starts in, in October, 1503, and he leaves France in 1507. So that takes about four years. To do this yeah, painting? Uh, yes. Four years? Four years, yes. Now, during that period of time, how would he subsist? I mean, is he being sponsored by someone? I mean, No, he worked on many projects. He worked for, uh, for Borgia. He, wor he was working on, the, on his dream. His dream was to, to change the way of the Arno River. You know, the, the river Arno, go through Florence, go to the mountain. So th you cannot put a boat on, on the river because it's too, too much dangerous. And the river arrive, well, go through the valley, arrive in the city of Pise, and then go to the sea. And the dream of Leonardo was to change the way of the river to make a long turn to make it navigable. No, I understand. So what you're suggesting... So he wa no, I just tell you that he was working on many projects. Kind of Yes, he worked on the machinery, invention of machinery. He was working on a new technique <coughs> for the painting. He was working on a new varnish. He was working on, uh, on, the, on geographic maps. Uh, he drew many maps. So uh, that takes time. So he... he he do not really work four years, but with part time, it takes four years to, to do this painting. And part of it is drying. In uh, uh, and waiting that is drying, of course. So it's because the oil, oil is take time, take six months to dry. So it concurrently is doing all sorts of things. So one of uh, the discoveries that I made, uh, if we go back to this one, uh, how Leonardo, mm -hmm. why Leonardo changed the, the cheek. So he, 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 he makes the cheek wider because it changes the position of the head. So if you look at the right, your, your cheek on the right side is smaller. If you change the position, your cheek is wider. So this is one more proof that it changes the position of the head. You see, the, this is the limit uh, how the quantity of pigment that Leonardo had to change the, the, the position of the head. Also, he does the same on the, on the nose. Ah, that is incredible. You see the crosses here? These crosses here? <coughs> These crosses are the position of the head. And the position of the head do not match with Mona Lisa today. Why? Because, one more time, the portrait look on the right. Also the mouse, or look at the mouse with the lamp technique. We see a, a very f uh, uh, feminine, feminine room, uh, uh, mouse, small, much more beautiful than today. Today is the smiling, it's smiling, but it's less feminine, I think. So this is the outline of the, the head of uh, 
Lisa Gardini, and this is a, an artistic uh, projection of how was the, real, the portrait of uh, Lisa Gardini, and the headdress is perfect. This is really the world at this time in the, Florence, in the city of Florence. Also the dress, so I discover the finestrelle, the notes, the veil on the shoulder, so to, to understand, and the embroidery that go up to the shoulder. And, and today, today the embroidery with the naked eye, the embroidery stop here, behind the veil, the veils. Uh, but we, thanks to the lamp technique, you can see also the embroidery that continue on the shoulders. The shirt also, how we change the shirt. And the spall vero of the church also. It changed also the position of the hand. So this is the previous position of the fingers. The simulation. And so we have recovered everything. We have recovered totally the, uh, the portrait of Lisa Gardini. We have all the elements that demonstrate that behind the portrait today, we have another portrait. So we, we make a, a proof, a real proof. The shirt, the ganure, the sleeve, and we attach the sleeve and the ganure, and we put the veil. And so I, I built also the, the chair. We reproduce the chair, and so we have it. So now we are, so Leonardo uh, leave Florence in 1507 and he go to Milan. In Milan he worked to, on anatomy he, because the French king authorized him to make a dissection on cadaver, so he work on that and he don't paint a lot. But when he worked for uh, Giuliano de Medicis, so he go to the Vatican City, and inside the Vatican City, you know, in 1513, uh, Giuliano de Medicis, we have the testimony of Leonardo, mm -hmm. Giuliano de Medicis asked him to make a portrait. And so we have first to erase again <coughs> the previous portrait, and so he, he erase, he scratch the previous limit of the head of uh, Lisa Gerardini. We can clearly see the scratch here, here. And he used a new technique called the sfumato to uh, transform, it's like a mask, to transform the portrait and to change the position of the head. And this mask is clearly visible with the lamp technique. So, we are in 1503, we have, we have the portrait of Lisa Gerardini. He transformed in, in 1530 the portrait on demand of Giuliano de Medicis. And with the time, of course, the color change. And to, to hide the previous uh, dress, he covered totally the, um, the previous dress with a veil. But he wanted that the veil was very wide. Mm -hmm. So he, he, he drew uh, another armchair to put the veil on top. So you can see that on the portrait of Lisa Gerardini, the armchair is in perfect alignment with the armchair here. But for the reason to put a veil, 
So the mask, transformation mask, so he had another arm dress here to envelop, to totally cover, well, to like this. So he covered totally the dress and hide totally the previous dress. So we, we cannot see anymore the Florentine dress. So he changed the position of the head. And this is the result today. And if we go back to the biography of Paolo Lomazzo, we understand now why Paolo Lomazzo uh, uh, explains that Leonardo uh, makes the portrait of uh, de la Joconde et de Mona Lima. Because there is two portraits, in fact. <coughs> so now there is a uh, hypothesis. Alors, this is not clear. This is not clear if he paint first the portrait with pearls, then the dwarf of the portrait. Maybe we can invert these two. And uh, of course, he paints in 1503, he paints Lisa Gerardini. He lived to Milan, and in 1570, uh, he transformed on the request at Giuliano de Medici, he transformed, transformed the portrait. The question is why he transformed the portrait. Alors, about uh, the Madonna, we have uh, a letter of Isabella d'Est. And Isabella d'Est asked to Leonardo to paint a portrait of, uh, of a Madonna. So we have uh, the writing proof. And the date is March 1501. To, to two years before he started to paint Lisa Gardini. That could explain that he started to paint Mona Lisa, to, to paint the, the, the headdress of the Madonna. The, 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 the oil is drying, become uh, very hard. He cannot uh, uh, erase it easily, so he scratch. He scratched the headdress, the project, the draft of the headdress. He scratched it. And he paint over <coughs> uh, the sky. Well, he's constrained by the, the fabric, the, the, uh, the wood. Uh, that is, he has this template that he has to use over and over and over again. Yes, because uh, probably he start, he, uh, he have start the, the landscape, the beginning of the landscape. Um, because the landscape, um, uh, inside the landscape, there is a project of the derivation of the change of the way of the Arno River. Well, no, what I'm saying is he has this, this wood, and he, can't, he uses that same wood for over and over and over again. Why not? Well, it just seems a little strange. It wouldn't be easier to get another piece of wood, but apparently wood is so expensive, you can't... Yes, but no, it's not expensive. It takes time. <laughs> So that takes time to have a plank of wood. If you have to apply the preparation, the gesso, the white surface, you have to make 20 layers. So you have to wait uh, one week between each layer. So it's, it's crazy. Because wh why wouldn't he have uh, 10 pieces of wood and do 10 at the same time? Uh, all I'm suggesting is uh, it seems to be not real productive to have to go through time and time again the same piece of wood changing as the, the circumstances change. But that's OK. It's just that it sounds a little no, different. It's, it's a way to, to work of Leonardo. He has the plank of poplar ready in his workshop. He uses it. <coughs> OK, I have to chant something and he erase it. And that's enough. Take, take 10 minutes to erase something. Just take, uh, take ten, 10 minutes, yes. No, it's not a problem. That's a whole different vision of not a problem. what I would have expected. So, and we have another document very important. And the date is 1550. 1515, and uh, we have the, this document. It's a uh, uh, madrigal, is a kind of uh, poem, a chanson. And um, in this madrigal, he explained clearly that uh, he saw for the first time the beautiful uh, portrait with a beautiful dark veil. And the date is very important because the date match with the fact that Leonardo was working for Giuliano de Medicis. 
It was really long text, I'm sorry. What's the summary of this? The summary of this, um, so I explained that in fact, um, Giuliano de' Medici, when Giuliano arrived in the Vat Vatican City, he arrived with a small child, two years or three years old. The mother died during the birth of the baby, so we have no mother. And Giuliano uh, asked, so the hypothesis is, Giuliano asked to Leonardo to paint a portrait of a mother for the child. This is the hypothesis. And uh, the child is famous because uh, the Pope, so the brother of Giuliano, <coughs> is the uncle of the small child. Okay? And the Pope asked to a painter to, uh, on a fresco to paint the small, small boy inside the fresco uh, holding the crown to the Pope. Uh, not the Pope, so the Charlemagne, it says Charlemagne. So he represents uh, the portrait. So the, the main idea is uh, Giuliano de' Medici asked to Leonardo to paint a, a portrait of a mother for the child, but he don't have the time, as always. So he takes the, por the unfinished portrait of Lisa Gerardini, he keeps the hand, he keeps the sleeve, he keeps the armchair, he keeps the landscape. He just changes the position of the head and cover everything with a veil that take one month. So that's the way you uh, accommodate yeah. requests. And so um, <coughs> not everybody agree with this hypothesis. <laughs> <laughs> but, the, but the picture are here. So I do. I cannot invent such kind of picture, okay? So I, I wrote a book, so this book, and inside the book there is uh, layers, transparency layers, and uh, the layers you can at the end of the book you have uh, the some not the, not the one thousand six hundred fifty picture, but you have a selection of ten lamb picture. And you can, by yourself, reinvestigate my work. So you can take a layer. For example, you want to see the, the Madonna. Hop, you can take the transparency of the Madonna. And you can check by yourself if I am not lying. Okay? <laughs> and you can put on the lamp picture, and you can try by yourself. So that's the conclusion. That's the conclusion. Well, thank you very much. So now there is a quiz. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, Pascal, thank you so much. I can, I can promise you that never before in this French-founded community since 1680, when the French first came, has such an excellent talk been given on the Mona Lisa, <laughs> as there was tonight. So thanks, uh, as always, to Ed Sikowski, who, who is a great question asker. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Ed. Thank you. So uh, s uh, our, let me say that this exhibition is very special for Peoria to have. Uh, the French Consul General was down our good friend uh, Guillaume Lacroix, and he stood in front of Pascal's Mona Lisa, and he said on this, the 500th anniversary of the death of Lo Mona Lisa, hey, you can go to the Louvre or you can come to Peoria. <laughs> so one, both, both cities yeah. uh, that begin with P. Yeah. So I want to give a shout out to Dr. Alan Campbell who walked in my office two years and 10 months ago in my first week on the job as your director and said, wouldn't it be something if we could do an exhibition of some kind on Leonardo da Vinci, the greatest genius of all time. And Alan and his wife Marlene are here, along with a number of other uh, sponsors, put up a significant amount of money, 200000 in total, 
to help us secure this exhibition uh, between the Bielfeld Foundation and PNC and our Visionary Society members um, and, and many others. So let's, uh, let's hear it for the sponsors who helped us bring in. <laughs> finally, uh, finally uh, Pascal, if you'd, if you'd come forward, and I think you can, you can walk over here. I'm joined by Steve Jackson, our chairman of the board, and uh, I want to present to you, if I can get it out of the container, oh. a, Lucite, a Lucite recognition of your uh, appearance at the Peoria Riverfront Museum. And thanks on behalf of all of us, thank you. This is good for free parking in our garage for life. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, and uh, on behalf of Steve Jackson and the board and all of us, thank you. Uh, merci beaucoup. Uh, Pascal will uh, be signing uh, copies of the book. There are limited numbers, so if we do not have a copy of the book, Pascal will sign a, a plate, a, a signature plate that will go in your copy. We'll take the orders and we'll get you those copies as soon as they come in, if we do not have enough. And he also has rock star photos uh, <laughs> that he can sign of himself with his copy of the Mona Lisa. Uh, once again, thank you all for coming tonight, and uh, have, a, have a great evening. God bless.